climate change, loss of biodiversity, mental illness, and mass migration. You really have to pay attention to not recognize that we have a lot of challenges ahead of us. Businesses, really, really good at, uh, at reaching some metrics, such as revenue and growth, but many times at the expense on other metrics, such as people and planet, they are in the real epicenter of the challenges that we have today. And business as usual is no longer an acceptable strategy. My name is Niklas Adalbert, and uh, after 10 years of uh, consumer credits and payments, I decided to quit and instead start Norsken Foundation, where we are today. And uh, at Norsken, we believe that the next generation of startups is not necessarily yet another consumer credit company or an addictive computer game or an online casino in your phone, but instead that the next generation of startups, that is impact startups, that with their business model are solving a societal issue. And we're going to have one perfect example of this here today, and it's uh, Karma, that uh, anyone can download and you can buy discounted food from restaurants that otherwise would have gone to waste. So they have a one-to-one -one relation with how much revenue they make and how much impact they are doing. It's beautiful, right? Um, and Norsken, we are supporting and investing in these kinds of startups, which is quite easy if you compare to the challenge that large corporations have in turning themselves into sustainable organizations. I mean, defending billions of revenues and having hundreds of thousands of employees and different stakeholders and shareholders, not an easy task, and I'm not envy on those leaders. And that's why I'm so happy to co-host this event here today. And I'm extra happy that uh, the topic of today is very much aligned to Norsken's mission. And that is, how can we accelerate the future of purposeful businesses? And with that said, I'm really happy to uh, introduce the two first persons here on stage and two first sustainability leaders. And the first one is Henrik Henriksson, the president and CEO of Scania, a leading supplier of solutions and services for sustainable transport that is driving the shift towards a fossil-free transport system for heavy commercial vehicles. A fierce advocacy for sustainability, Henrik is an advisor to the Swedish government and part of its Agenda 2030 delegation. And we have Elaine Weidman, Weidman, Greenewald, did I say it right? Sort of. Uh, an expert on global sustainability and development issues. Elaine has spent over two decades in the private sector focusing on digitalization and sustainable development, where she pioneered the Tech for Good movement. She's a co founder of the AI Sustainability Center, a world leading center for assessing the societal implications of AI and data-driven challenges. A warm applaud on stage, Henrik and Elaine. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. So, I don't know, Henrik, did you ever think we would write this book, let alone finish it? <laughs> no, no, sometimes not, actually. But uh, doing that venture, uh, I mean, it's been a fantastic journey. We uh, met so many great leaders, inspirational leaders. Actually, one of them being Johan Rockström, uh, who is a professor at the Potsdam Institute in uh, Berlin, uh, well known. Uh, and of course, what he did, he provided us with a foreword for the book um, and putting actually sustainability and the challenges of climate change into a scientific perspective. And uh, we have Johan with us now on a link uh, from uh, Berlin. Uh, and he's going to start by framing this event uh, and putting a little bit of a scientific touch on it and also give us the, the state of the planet. So, uh, Johan. 
So thanks, uh, Henrik and Elaine, and hello everyone in Stockholm. This is a really important gathering at a very important juncture in time. We're in the midst of a health crisis. We have scientific evidence that this is a multiple crisis that interacts with each other. We have a climate crisis, an ecosystem crisis. COVID-19 is a manifestation of our inability to handle sustainably with our natural habitats of ecosystems hosting wildlife that tips over in zoonotic viral spillovers that then shocks the whole world economy and devastating impacts on humans. We also have so much scientific evidence today that we're in the Anthropocene, the geological epoch where humans dominate all functions in the Earth system. So if a viral crisis across the economy can spill over from one point on the planet, we also have evidence today that we have tipping points in other parts of the planet that can send invoices affecting economies and human development across the whole world. In fact, the latest science from the climate modeling that we've run here at the Potsdam Institute shows, can you believe it, that over the past three million years in the entire geological epoch that we call the Pleistocene, we've never passed two degrees Celsius warming. And now we have raised temperatures to 1.2 degrees Celsius and are following a path that it could take us to three, above three degrees Celsius in just 80 years. This would wind back the climate clock five to 10 million years. It is really time to turn around. We have an urgency point, so bad in fact, that scientifically we define this today as a planetary emergency. Now you may have seen just two days back, we got the latest signs from the Amazon showing that 40% of the rainforest is today so under such pressure because of deforestation and global warming that it can be in multiple states, both rainforest and savanna state. We cannot exclude a tipping point irreversibly moving towards savannas. You may have seen two weeks back, the latest signs on West Antarctica, that large parts of the ice sheets have already crossed the tipping point, which means that the IPCC has been underestimating sea level rise trajectories which, as you know, are estimated to one meter this century, but it could thereby be higher. So we have all the evidence we need for transformative change. Now, the good news is that the window is, according to the scientific assessment, still open for us to transition towards a safe operating space on Earth. Science can define science-based targets within planetary boundaries, and it's really the most going to say that the most important light in the tunnel we see today is that businesses around the world are showing leadership. Policy is gradually coming, you know, in line with business. But when we see across different sectors in the world, the, the understanding that sustainability is now an entry point for competitiveness, for markets to be stable, and for better futures, not only for businesses, but for man, humanity at large. And this new entry point where sustainability is moving from being an environmental agenda to being a central core strategy for business is represented, I think, in a, in a beautiful way in Elaine's and, and Henrik's book. I always quote you, Henrik, when I get a chance that the head of Scania, one of the difficult to abate industries in the world, does not see a contradiction between sustainability and profitability. And to me, this is the avenue for our success to accelerate and amplify the pathway towards a decarbonized, sustainable and equitable future, because we need to show that the journey to sustainability is more attractive. It's not the big sacrifice, it's the avenue for our future, a more modern and a more equitable world. So again, congratulations to the book, have a wonderful dialogue on the path forward. And let's see this as one important piece in the momentum towards a better future. Thank you very much. So it's a sobering message that we mm. wanted to start with. The climate change, the global pandemic, and severe ecosystem loss. Um, but that was really one of the impetuses for the book because we felt that there's really never been a more important time for business to act. And we think that there's both responsibility that companies have to play, but also an opportunity. And 
our book is all about accelerating that leadership and accelerating it quickly. Mm. And as Yoan said, mm. you're in a tough spot as a mm. CEO of a, in the transport sector, oh. um, an industry representing some 20% of global CO2 emissions, hard to abate sector as it's called. Yet, I don't know that I've ever met anyone who understood or understands the imperative to act more than you do. So what advice, what do you say, Henrik, when it comes to what business should do? No, but you're right. I mean, we, we are part of a problem. Uh, we are, but we really want to be part of the solution as well. And I think that's the mindset we as business leaders have to have. And listening to, to you one as well, I mean, we, we have that opportunity. And I think we're on, on our way to sort of show that sort of leadership. Uh, and I think we're moving away from this mindset of take no risk whatsoever uh, and to actually take a leap forward. Um, and, and if you think about it, if, if you look at the list of the 100 richest entities on this planet, and by entity we mean like organizations, companies and countries, actually 69 out of the top 100 are companies. So, I mean, it's up to us. I mean, and, and, and corporate life and, and companies will play a key role in this transformation. The question, though, is how do we make that happen? So on the how, as mm. you know, in the book, we, we created a model. We wanted to come up with something simple, simple and practical that any business leader anywhere on their own sustainability journey could use. So the model is three steps. The first step is about finding your own foundation and building a foundation on responsible business principles and responsible trust. But it's not just about the responsibility part, it's about putting a stake in the ground and knowing your purpose and standing up for that purpose. And one of the companies we interviewed in the book in the first part of the model was Telia Company, who had to do a major transformation, struggling with some pretty real responsibility issues and being able to work with their leadership, turn that around and come out even stronger um, in both sustainability, but also in the telecom industry in general. Um, so the second phase of the model is about the core business. And we had a lot of people say, well, integrating sustainability into the core business, those are just buzzwords. Well, they can be buzzwords, but they become very real when you're able to connect to the value creation with your customer and you're able to drive sales in that regard. Two of my favorite examples in the book in that regard are Northvolt, a company that had a vision to create the world's greenest battery, and also Sweco, designing the sustainable cities of the future. Those are two companies that really got it right at the core, and we're gonna come back to the core in the first panel. The third part of the model is what we call the leap. And the leap is when we think it's all about the leap. This is when it really starts to get interesting because it's your point of departure. It's really going for stretch. It's going for thinking about taking these you know, existential problems, exponential problems, and realizing that you actually won't be able to solve them with incremental solutions. So you need to think in more transformative terms. And that's what we call the leap. And we'll come back to that as well. Mm. So that's the model. So, I mean, with the model, of course, uh, we expect to get progress. Uh, and um, I think at the end of the day, like the title of the book, it's not about only transforming your company, your industry, but actually also the world. Um, and of course, there is good examples out there now. There's a lot of companies who is taking up brave uh, sustainability targets. Uh, they are integrating sustainability, starting that journey. Uh, we hear a lot about sort of uh, sustainability as business as the usual. But we would say that, that that is actually not what we are after. I mean, that is just incremental improvements and, and, and change. Uh, that, that will not change your, your company or your industry or, or the world. Now, you need to go beyond that. You need to, to make that extra leap forward. Um, and that's what we call the journey to exponentiality. And, and how, do you, how do you make that journey uh, happen then? And, and um, we believe that uh, the first thing you need to do is, is to um, look beyond your sort of uh, uh, existing as an industry vertical or belonging as a sector uh, and into a silo. You need to put on what we call an 360 degree goggles. Uh, and with that, you start seeing your surrounding as an ecosystem, which is something much, much 
uh, bigger. Uh, and in that ecosystem, then you need to apply what we would call then a planetary lens and, and a suicidal lens. And when you do that, suddenly you start to see everything in a different context. You need you start to see new business opportunities, profit pools, but also new risks and 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 uh, hurdles that you will have. Uh, but it is by doing that transformation, having this ecosystem approach, that you you will be able to to move forward. To put this a little bit more in clarity, let's use Scania as an example here. Uh, we um, used to belong to an industry a vertical of, of heavy commercial vehicles. Now we are thinking ourselves belonging to an ecosystem of transport and logistics, something much, much bigger. In that uh, ecosystem, we want to drive the shift towards a sustainable system of transport. Uh, and one way to do that is, of course, to transform all the vehicles running on fossil fuels today to biofuels. And to do that, then, of course, we needed to put on these lenses and, and figure out, because biofuels is a little bit controversial sometimes, you know, palm oil and all this, but there's a lot of good sustainable biofuels. So we needed to build knowledge, scientific-based knowledge in that ecosystem, using Yuan and some of his friends to, to get deep understanding, uh, and that way applying then different lens. That gave us an opportunity to, to see how can we actually tweak our business model, our value proposition, and how we charge. And one of the things we figured out quite early was that uh, actually our, our customers, most of them are small mama-papa business. They, they don't really uh, have the, 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 the power in the value chain to create transformation. But our customers, customer, they don't buy any trucks or buses from it, but they are big companies that design the logistical system. Those are the ones we should talk to. And that's how we create the change. And I think these are different examples then of how you need to, to, to uh, change your mindset on this exponentiality journey and, and uh, take these first steps. And, and there is many more steps in the book, and we will come back to them later on. Yeah, and so we introduced this model. We came up with these new concepts like exponentiality and the societal lens that you described. But I think we also promised people that we were going to reveal something about Sweden's secret sauce. So um, <laughs> you're the Swedish one here. So I have to ask you, what is it about Sweden? Yeah, the Swedish angle. Yeah, I, I think it is. Um, I think it's something in our DNA in, in, uh, in Sweden, and maybe it is, uh, uh, maybe it's linked to, um, uh, to the long winters we have. You know, winter is coming. Uh, you need to plan forward, think about sort of how do you survive uh, the 12-month cycle. <laughs> uh, so I think that has given us some sort of uh, planning horizon and an ability to plan. Uh, I think it's also linked to uh, maybe the closeness to nature that we have. We will meet Eva later on. I think she has that in her DNA. Uh, but also, I like one of the quotes and, and suggestions we got from uh, Juna Samuelsson, uh, the CEO of Electrolux. He said that, uh, you know, I think it has to do with the Maslow's and, and the development that we have. I mean, we have come so far on the Maslow sort of journey that we have all the security, all the safety network in Sweden. Uh, I mean, we have a good life. We can take sort of the liberty to actually start thinking a little bit beyond about sustainability. And I think uh, he's right. So, so I think maybe we are doing something uh, good up here north of the wall uh, in, in a way that um, maybe uh, we don't brag about it, but I mean, maybe we're doing something right here. Yeah, so that was a bit modestly Swedish. So <laughs> I'll, do, I'll do a bit more bragging. So I think that, you know, Sweden always punches above its weight. Actually, you could look at any global sustainability index anywhere, and you see that Sweden, there is something about Sweden. Sweden is ranking in that top uh, area every time. And um, even just this week, mm. um, Ericsson was named uh, one of the most sustainable companies on the Wall Street Journal Global 100 list. And we have Stora Enso that um, got ranked one of the top 10 sustainability reports in the world by the World Business Council on Sustainable Development. So there's definitely something about Sweden. And um, I always think that Sweden and the Nordics more broadly is about 15 years mm. ahead conceptually when it comes to sustainable development. And I don't really think it matters whether you're in business or whether you're in government or where you sit. If you're in a leadership position, it's always on the agenda. And it's not just buried on the agenda, it's on the top of the agenda. And I think that's really some inspiration that we want to convey you know, to other leaders in other mm. parts of the world with our book. Yeah, correct. And let's hear more about that from, from our panel. Uh, the first panel will soon come up on, on stage. So thank you, Elaine. Thank you. Um, but I will take on Elaine's words as well and, and actually be maybe not so uh, modest and, and actually start with example uh, 
of um, the part two of the, uh, the model that Elaine was into. How do you build sustainability into the core? Uh, and I will use Scania then, uh, being a little bit unconventional, start with that uh, as an example. What have we done at Scania to build core into to the, uh, the company? The first thing we did was to create a very clear purpose. Uh, our purpose as a company is to drive the shift towards a more sustainable transport system. And we made sure that that purpose was well anchored in our stakeholders. And you think about the, the natural one that uh, it is the customer, it is the uh, employees, uh, and it's also, of course, the, the owners of the capital. But we made sure also to address society as a stakeholder. Uh, and made sure that our purpose fits to all of those four categories. In addition, we made sure also that our purpose fits well and, and is built on our core values, core values that we have had with us for the last 25 years, core values that are deeply rooted in the DNA of people. And the reason to do that is that people need to recognize the purpose, otherwise they, they will get lost. They need to connect something back to the spine that they, they feel that sits in the wall of, of the company. And if you do that, uh, you need to build it on the core values. What we also did as Ghana was that we decided not to put sustainability on top of everything we do or, or, or side by it. Uh, actually, we don't have a sustainability strategy at, at Scania. We have one sustainable strategy. We don't have a sustainability department in the company. Everyone is responsible uh, in the functional organizations and in the cross-processes areas. It is everyone's duties to, to drive the sustainability issue. And I think it also meant that we had to build it into our business model. I talked about the ecosystem before, and, and, and uh, actually we needed to tweak our business model and, and how we create value, and, and actually at the end of the day, who is the decision maker or who is, is the customer. But also important that you get everyone on board. I myself, I come from, from the sales side. Um, uh, in, in the company, and uh, during that journey, I've realized that, I mean, if you don't see sustainability, when you have transformed your own operation and then your products and services, if you don't see it coming through in sales, it is not happening for real. Because everyone in the organization is looking at what is actually happening out in the market, the people developing it, the building it, and sourcing it. So if you don't see it coming through in sales, it will just be greenwashing. With those words, uh, I would like to invite uh, Eva and Rickard up to on stage, and, and uh, we will continue our panel here together. Um, Eva, who is the CEO of uh, Houdini uh, Sportswear, and, and Rickard, who is the CEO of uh, SAS. Uh, and I will start with you, um, uh, Eva. Thank you for coming. Uh, and uh, tell me, I mean, you, you're always uh, my favorite benchmark company because you're always two, <laughs> two or three steps ahead of us all the time. So. How have you managed to build sustainability into the core of Houdini? Well, I, I think, you, first of all, we've brought our personal beliefs and values mm -hmm. into the company, and that has been very important for me as a CEO to keep that culture while we've been growing, mm -hmm. so that it doesn't, uh, an employee should feel like that personal, the values as a mother or a neighbor or just a friend, mm -hmm. somebody who loves the outdoor, of course, in our mm -hmm. case. Uh, those values are really important for us, mm. uh, doing business mm. and not having some co corporate, you know, <laughs> bullshit <Yeah. laughs> uh, that uh, doesn't uh, allow us to be creative mm. and, and envision what we want to create in terms of a, a world or a society. Mm. So values and then, then being uncompromising in moving towards our vision. In, so in we've had way? a very clear... Un how we're uncom uncompromising. Yeah, in what way? I think we've been very good at questioning ourselves. Mm. Uh, okay. Questioning conventions in our industry, in, in society, like shopping uh, to death instead mm. of being in, in the outdoors where, mm. where, where the products are intended to, or designed to be. Um, so questioning ourselves and conventions to make sure that we uh, realize those design flaws that are everywhere. Mm. Uh, in value chains and um, yeah, everywhere, really. And we've just made it our uh, job and challenge to fix those design flaws. Mm. And it's, I mean, it's such a rewarding journey. Uh, there's, <laughs> I can imagine. There is a personal passion mm. within the company instead of, uh, of uh, um, reluctance mm. and pride. 
Um, I, I recognize that, and I, I can uh, I can see that in in your face as well. <laughs> I know that one of the things where I feel that you are one step ahead as well is, is to to, uh, to work with the planetary boundaries. You one was also mentioning that. I mean, Stockholm Resilience Center. I know that you work with them. Mm -hmm. I mean, sort of thinking. Of, I mean, for those of you who don't know, planetary boundaries more like. I mean, we have a certain limit on this planet. I mean, how much can we sort of admit on the CO2 or, or biodiversity or, or or water? I mean, what, what are the limits there? But how, how have you been able to implement that into your business strategy or the company? Um, well, we've hold, held uh, Earth system scientists by the hand okay. to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the framework in itself, it, it, it's not only about metrics and, uh, and uh, measuring everything, but it's also about understanding the scope. You were talking about the ecosystem. Mm. I mean, we're part of a living system and mm. we've created this machine where we don't see uh, the entire living system. Oh. And understanding the flows and processes and the interconnections makes it possible for us to, to do the right thing, understand uh, the functions of the system, how we can impact it, uh, or, and how, how we can change and evolve. Mm. And looking at uh, nature as a system and mimicking that has been fantastic for us. Biomimicry in terms of material innovation, but also business models and um, organizational culture. In every sense of the way, there's so much to learn from nature. From nature, yeah. yeah. Oh, good. I will come back to you soon, Eva. Rikyad, I mean, um, b being the CEO of an airline company today, I mean, it, it uh, must be a very Joy. challenging, uh, challenging job. But, but how how do you, through a crisis like this, uh, keep your north star and keep focus on sustainability that I know is very important for you? How do you keep that focus even if you're going through tough times? I think we have realized that for us, sustainability is actually existential for us. If we don't demonstrate quickly a trustworthy path towards a more sustainable future, we won't have a future because there will be a patchwork of regulatory issues. There will be taxes, there will be, you know, and, and consumers will stop flying. Uh, and we truly believe, I think, within SAS that aviation is doing good. Aviation matters because by pe getting people to meet creates jobs. Mm. It provides the foundation for trade. Uh, hopefully it creates a safer society where you have mutual respect and it enriches people. And those things we want to bring on and rather do more of than less of, but that will not happen if we cannot provide a more sustainable air journey. And that's our passion. Mm. And I think that's also carrying us through this crisis where you know, we really see hands-on you know, today what happens when people cannot fly. Mm. Uh, and we want to get back there. We want to get up there. And we know the only way to do it is making sure that we can demonstrate it uh, in a more sustainable way. Mm, sounds good. Um, I know also, like, like, just like Scania, I mean, you also are hard to abate industry. Um, we, we see a lot of potential in, in the bioeconomy and yep. biofuels yep. as a way for sort of to reduce uh, emissions. And do you do you agree with that? Is that an opportunity for you as well? It, it's it's the thing for us at the moment because I see the evolution in, in different steps. Firstly, what we can do now is to invest in the most modern and most fuel efficient aircraft. Then, longer term, I'm sure there will be some bright woman or man who will come up with an idea how to power a large jet that is f completely zero emission. Mm. But that's, you know, 15 years out there. And then we need the bridge from today to the future, and that bridge is sustainable aviation fuels. Mm. And that technology will evolve. It will be bio-based. Mm. Further on, I think it will be s synthetic fuels as well. Mm. We actually take green energy, you take captured CO2 mm. and hydrogen, mm. and then you can actually create fuels. Mm. No, I, I like that, and I think also I like this here and now approach because I think as you one was into, we, we cannot uh, sit and wait for that no. perfect silver bullet that might come uh, in the future. We need to work with what we have here and right. now. And a modern aircraft engine can actually fly on these, these fuels. fuels yeah. So it's, the technology is there. We just need to get it. You, you, you told us when we, we met for the book, you told us one, one uh, thing that we got really stuck with us, and that was that uh, uh, you really tried to change not your own company only, but also your industry. And, and you were uh, trying to sort of move your quite uh, sort of um, <laughs> uh, old school type of uh, industry association. Can you tell us about that? 
Yeah, it's true. You know, uh, on the global scale, uh, SAS is, is not a large carrier. We are fairly small. So even if we do things, it doesn't really matter if the whole industry is not moving. And I happen to be a member of the Board of Governors of our global association called IATA. And we meet um, that board or that group, we meet twice a year. And it's a fairly sizable group. We talk about maybe 35 people or so. And um, I think it was in December 2018, I stood up and I told my colleagues that, guys, we're missing the boat. If we don't, as an industry, can articulate a, a path towards a more sustainable future, we have no future. And, you know, we're going to be a pretty scary ride ahead of us. And I draw blanks around the table. No one was really, you know, <laughs> stepping up to that challenge, except maybe the, the people from New Zealand. Air New Zealand said, yeah, the guy is right. We, are, we need to do this. But I was rather kind of downbeat after that. But, you know, six months later, we met again, and I did the same pitch. <laughs> and um, more people woke up. All of a sudden, I got most of Europe with me. I got Japan, I got Australia, and, of course, New Zealand. Uh, Air Canada, they started to move as well. But, you know, so I felt, you know, six months and more, more than two continents is not that shabby. So let's continue <laughs> to drive this. <laughs> But that's good. So I think we, because I think that's what uh, this is all about. I think it's it's not only about transforming your your, your company, your industry uh, has to come along as well. And I think uh, some of these uh, industry associations tend to be the the club for the smallest common denominator. And I think that's um, uh, that's a challenge. Well, well done there, Ricard. Uh, Eva, I'm coming back to you also. Uh, I read an article now, the, the, actually last week, that. Um, that you have published uh, like uh, some material that you, you're providing an open source mind uh, thinking of, uh, you're actually sharing it with everyone, uh, something that you come up with. Is, can you tell us about yes, that? Yes, that's correct. Um, I mean, first of all, there's a sense of urgency. You was talking about that as well. Uh, we, we really need to collaborate in order to make mm. things happen within the industry, but also across sectors. Um, so that has really been the way we've been working always, but, uh, but also sharing, sharing knowledge on innovations and not, not keeping sustainable innovation to ourselves. Self, yeah. I mean, we, we want to save the world. That's why we're doing sustainable innovation. So then we need to share it. Mm. And um, yeah, that time is, uh, is now. We need to do it now. Mm. And for us, uh, it's always been rewarding. And I... And I truly believe that with, without collaboration mm. and having maybe collaboration even as a, as a foundation in mm. business and some competition on the top, now we have the opposite uh, yeah. um, combination. So uh, I, I truly believe that's where we need to be heading. Mm. And that's how humanity has evolved even. Uh, yeah, I mean, right. Collaboration has been mm. the, the main uh, uh, yeah. thing that has helped us get where we are now. So. Mm. I think we can do much more of that. Yeah, we can. No, I think that's uh, that's a great example, and I think that's that's a great uh, finishing for our uh, first panel so, as well. Thank you, uh, thank you, Eva. Thank you, Rickard. And, and uh, thank you. we are now going to continue with a second panel, and, and I will ask. Uh, <laughs> thank you, um, Elaine, to come up again. So so welcome back, Elaine. Okay. <laughs> and now the floor is yours. Thanks. <laughs> Right, so the second panel is about purpose, trust, and having society as a stakeholder. In the book, Henrik and I defined purpose is what is the one thing that your company does that adds value to society that you do better than anyone else can do? And it's a cause that's greater than a profit. And purpose-driven CEOs start by setting the tone from the top, but then they engage themselves personally, but also their organization in that cause or that mission. And um, there was a, a study by um, the corporate board and EY that talks about purpose-driven companies outperform the stock market by 42%. And, that, and those companies that are not purpose-driven underperform by 40%. So in this decade of action that we have now with the sustainable development goals ahead of us, we need to have you know, that sense of purpose in sight. But I also want to talk for a minute about the um, Edelman 2020 trust barometer, because the trust barometer looks at the rise of companies as being the most trusted institution when it comes to governance in the world. 
And it also, they also showed that 92% of employees expect their CEO or their leaders to take a stand and to start to speak out on some of these issues. So with that as a backdrop, I'd like to introduce two of the most outspoken and purpose-driven CEOs that I know, Elsa Bernadette from Karma, co-founder of Karma and CEO. Welcome up, Elsa. And also Hans Vesberg, chairman and CEO of Verizon, who'll be with us on link. Thank you. Maybe. I'm here. Oh, you're there. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Welcome, Hans. Back to your hometown. You. Yeah. We'll start with you, um, because you did something um, pretty bold. You set um, your four stakeholder groups, I think you call them your North Stars, and you put society on the same level that you put your shareholders, your customers, and your employees. And I wanted to ask you to start by explaining what, what does it mean for a company of your size now to, to make that move? What signal, what are you saying with that move? Of course, it's a quite a, a big move and we were doing a, a big transformation. We call it Verizon 2.0. Uh, the company is probably 120 years old, but in this form we have right now, we're 20 years old. So this is the second iteration of the company. And uh, what we try to do in this transformation that changed quite a lot in the company, we also put up a North Star targets for the four stakeholders we have in our strategy. So that's employees, it's customers, society, and shareholders. So we made five-year plans for all of those, and we em embedded in the core strategy. And what we really wanted to do is, of course, see that we don't have society as philanthropy. I like philanthropy, it's great. And here in the US, philanthropy is very normal. Every corporation do it. But the problem was that it's sort of a side function of the company, and we wanted to bring it into a core strategy. So that means that every unit, uh, the corporation as such, has defined what they mean by how they're going to contribute in the society and how that is connected to our purpose of our company. So that's what we did. And uh, we have been doing that now for, I think, we're on our soon getting into our third year uh, to embed that in our company and that means also that the understanding in the company between the stakeholders and it's actually no compromising between them because you need to actually see that you are doing uh, uh, good for all stakeholders because ultimately they hang together they are in 100% interconnected to get a, a final good result so i think that's what we try to do and uh, I don't think it's uh, so much magic around it. It's just the way uh, you operate with a, a corporate strategy and the purpose together with four stakeholders. And what kind of impact is it having when you think about society? How do you measure that one? Are you looking at you know the number of people you impact, or, or what are you what do you measure there on on that quadrant? No, so what we try to do is, of course, doing things that are connected to our strategy. So we have three big pillars, of course, all based on the sustainable development goals and how we can support those. Uh, the first one is digital inclusion. And here we, uh, our measurement is that we're going to help uh, 10 million people in the U.S. to get uh, training or education uh, in digital skills. Uh, that means we're doing something called Verizon Innovative Learning. We're giving broadband devices and a digital STEM education for uh, uh, for children in, in uh, secondary uh, schools, so that uh, and especially in underserved. So that's a big undertaking. The second is what we do on the climate protection, where we think we also can contribute with our strategy. We, we are said we're going to be carbon neutral by 2035, and we're going to be uh, uh, having 50% uh, uh, renewable energy for all our electricity in 2025. Uh, big undertaking for a, a company like ours, but you need to start with yourself. And finally, human prosperity, where we're going to prepare half a million people for the next uh, type of jobs, technology jobs. All of it is part of our strategy, and we all underpinned it with uh, two and a half million hours of uh, volunteers. So our employees can volunteer, but they can only volunteer for these things that are part of our strategy. Our employees are volunteering for a lot of other great stuff, uh, which is philanthropy, but it has to be with either digital inclu inclusion, climate protection, or human prosperity. That's how we've done it, and uh, so far uh, it's been an extremely good reception in the company, and it's all tied together to our strategy. We're in broadband, 
our purpose is that we create the networks that move the world forward. So it hangs together. It's a great um, connection between purpose, culture, and values. I want to ask you one more question, because you often say that leadership is actually a profession. And I know, having worked with you for many years, <laughs> about um, how you set the tone from the top. And um, I also, I just think it would be interesting if you could share a bit how, how you see that and how you use your own, your own personal influencing platform as a way to drive change. Because as Henrik said in the beginning, some of the largest companies in the world, like Verizon, these days are, are larger than governments. So what responsibility do you have and how do you use your platform? Uh, so the responsibility is huge. I mean, as you said, the Edelman report and many have pointed out that 70% of the largest uh, entities in the world are corporation, and, and Verizon would of course qualify in that in that uh, group. And uh, so the responsibility for us, how we procure, how what type of rules we have, and how we speak about things. But what has been important for us and for me personally is that I speak about things that is part of our strategy. I can have a private opinion about a lot of things, but as long as I'm inside what is driving our company and our purpose, then I'm going to be very outspoken. And then uh, I had also uh, the, the fortune I worked with the Sustainable Development Goals, and I even started work with the Millennium development goals for many, many years. That tells you how old I am. Uh, but uh, what that meant is that you have a framework that is untouchable. The, the sustainable development goals is untouchable. They are agreed about 193 countries in the world. Uh, the technology is embedded in all of them. Uh, some of us uh, fought actually for having a goal that was mobility, broadband, and cloud. So I think that's how I've been speaking about it. It's embedded in the core uh, strategy of the company and the purpose of the company. So then it becomes very natural the times I'm speaking up about things uh, externally, especially around our society. Good. I don't know if you have met Elsa, uh, if you two have ever met. Um, so. No, but no. Uh, I want to um, ask Elsa. <laughs> to <laughs> you have um, a purpose-driven company that kind of starts with purpose from the core, from a, a startup, as Nicholas described in the beginning, um, looking at scaling the next generation of companies. Can you talk a bit about your purpose and, and what that has meant to you as a leader? Yeah, so um, for me, purposely, uh, purpose-driven uh, leadership is very, it's both a personal endeavor and a commercial at the same time. Um, and it's something that me and my co-founders have said that we really want to make a central focus point when we're running our business and building the Karma brand even. Maybe you have to say what it is. I'm not sure, like, uh, yeah, just I, everyone knows what Karma is. Yes, yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm running a company called Karma. I think Niklas did an excellent pitch earlier. But uh, we're on a mission to uh, solve the climate issue of food waste. So we built a technical platform where you can buy discounted food that otherwise would have been thrown away from restaurants. So it's a win-win. Um, if you don't, haven't used Karma yet, please download it and test it. Um, yes, so I mean, you know, purpose-driven leadership is very much the core of our business. And it's interesting looking back because when we founded Karma five years ago, we did something completely different. Karma was originally a deal platform, um, to put it simple. And for us, even though we saw a huge opportunity in that idea and in that product, it was something that didn't feel right. And after about six months or so, we asked ourselves, like, what is the issue here? And we, we came to the conclusion that we felt that we weren't really solving a real problem. And ultimately, we realized that we didn't really care if this product really existed or not. And that made us actually look around and question whether we could use this technology that we had built for six months for something that actually mattered. And that's when we came across with with food waste and realized just how big of an issue it is. And we did a pivot, as it's called. And that made a huge difference for us. And ever since that day, purpose-driven leadership has been, as I said, it's, it's been the, an integral part of our leadership and the culture at Karma. Um, so that's what it means for me. But I'm, I think also something that is worth mentioning, which I think that that's related more to maybe my generation or the next generation, which I think that you mentioned very well in the book, is that by 2025, millennials will represent 75% of the workforce. And according to PVC research, they've confirmed that um, of these millennials, 
uh, those who feel that they have a strong connection to the purpose of the company, they're 5.3 times more likely to stay. And as a company who obviously want to attract and retain the best talent, that's quite important numbers to think about. And then you should also bear in mind that these same group of millennials, they're also consuming in a purpose-driven way. Uh, and that's something we can see at Karma, that they're actively looking for brands who do um, show leadership and take a stand in issues like sustainability and show them products or solutions that would help them live according to those values. So to me, it's very much circular in that way. Like, purpose-driven leadership, it helps me to constantly think of how I can be more future-focused and innovate. It resonates with my team, and it also resonates with the, the people who engage with our brand and, and buy from Karma. In the book, it was really important to us. We wanted to capture all, we wanted to capture the big industrialist view. We wanted to capture startups, scale-ups, and everything in between, and individual leaders and back on that theme of like, what is it about Sweden? And I know, Hans, you never like to, you know, uh, go deep on that one, but just for the purposes of this very intimate audience and book, yeah. Did Sweden, do you think Sweden had any uh, effect on, on your leadership and in, in driving sustainable development as passionately as you have and do? Yeah, of course. I, I think all the equality and all the values you, you have brought up from your childhood has a big importance in your leadership. I think my huge impacts, of course, I, I got to see uh, the whole world uh, during my tenure at Ericsson and seeing the impact of technology uh, that it had in all the places in the world and, and how uh, how much you can solve with technology. So, of course, a, a big impact on my background, on how I act today, and, and the platform that I have, which is just unique of the size of it and the impact we have as a company, uh, then you bring that with you. So, of course, there's always uh, background and childhood uh, values coming from um, my Swedish heritage, that, that's for sure. Oh, thanks. And um, last question as we're... Got to keep the pace here. Um, Elsa, coming from the next generation of leaders, is there any advice you would want to give to Hans? <laughs> oh, God. Um, I'll, I'm all eager to hear. <laughs> how, how, hmm, well, I mean, I think I would be a terrible uh, entrepreneur if I didn't sort of vouch for my own company here. So I know that you're more than 100,000 employees, so maybe use karma well, and encourage your team to test out karma. <laughs> uh, I think that's one good advice. <laughs> that's a great pitch. I will definitely talk to my team to download karma to immediately. So that, okay. that's a great, great <laughs> idea. You got that on film. All right. Hans and Elsa, thank you so much. Thanks for joining. Big hand for both of them. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome back, Henrik. Thank you, Elaine. So great panels, uh, both of them. And uh, now we're going to actually take an opportunity to ask some questions to uh, some key people here in the audience as well. And uh, I would like to start with uh, Martin, Martin Schuld, who, who is uh, a professor and also the program director for the master program uh, when it comes to business and uh, management at the Stockholm School of Economics. And, uh, with a little bit of an academic angle then, Martin, I mean, um, uh, is there a great demand in academia and, and, and sort of um, research today when it comes to models and studies around sustainability leadership? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, I think research um, is divided in two halves. One, uh, one kind of research is about sustainability. And one part is about leadership and mm. competitiveness. And what you do very uh, neatly in your book, and that's very important, you bring it together. Mm. So uh, for the first time, I find a book that puts sustainability leadership into one piece. And you do that excellently well. OK, thank you. Yeah. Will, will, will that mean that do you see also that uh, your students, many of them, this is, I mean, you have a, a, a university with a lot of young students, but you also have an internationally renowned sort of uh, uh, master program. Uh, is it the same in both sort of uh, teams of uh, students, would you say, today? Um, I believe that, uh, you know, young students, they are much more mature than, than my generation is. Mm. <laughs> uh, they talk about sustainability, I, I would say, 
indirectly or directly every day. I look at mm -hmm. my own three kids, for instance. Uh, they live with su sustainability issues. And they ask me a lot of questions. Daddy, is that a good car you're driving? Daddy, are you? <laughs> and so forth. Um, but really, we have seen uh, environmental issues. We have seen uh, sustainability uh, uh, considerations as an isolated phenomenon uh, mm. within one part of research. And then the other part is about strategy, how you can uh, drive uh, profitability and competitiveness. But, but you do this uh, extremely well by, you, by bringing it together in, in this book. Uh, and I love the way you use cases, how you um, uh, build the model you've been talking about. It's practical, it's adaptable. So. Um, uh, Sounds like maybe we will get uh, some of the students to read it. <laughs> <laughs> no. We're lucky. You are most welcome to come to <laughs> Stockholm School of Economics <laughs> and you will meet uh, with all of the master students. So, yeah. Get challenged. It's a day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Martin. Yeah. Elizabeth Johnson. Um, as you know, we wrote the book for business leaders, but you're representing a generation, the millennials, the so-called millennials, who represent the future workforce. Um, building on the question that I asked Elsa um, about advice, what advice would, would you give to CEOs today when it comes to sustainability? Absolutely. So I would uh, ask the CEOs who haven't focused on sustainability thus far uh, to really take a look at their workforce. And so when I think about my generation and the generation behind me, we have already bought into this and we've studied it in our academic programs in university and hopefully even earlier than that. And so uh, we, but we, we're still early in our careers. And so we may not have that decision making power quite yet to make those transformational changes within an organization, but we do have the power to decide where we're going to work and if we're going to leave and mm -hmm. take our time and our talents and our skills and our best ideas to Ava and to Henrik and to all the speakers that we heard tonight who are leading organizations that are really walking the walk with these kinds of topics. And so I think for the CEOs who haven't prioritized this yet, if they aren't bought into the Yuan Rock Street and the, the climate scientists to motivate them to change, then maybe losing their workforce might. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, thank you. So uh, we also have with us Sarah McPhee, who is um, a, a global uh, SRI investor, among other things, also sitting in a number of sort of very interesting companies board. Um, when it comes to the, the financial market, it feels like we are starting to see something happening there as well. And, and uh, are we starting to see social responsible investment becoming mainstream? I, th I think we have uh, quite a ways to go to mainstream, but uh, some very good things have happened. I think one of them is that consumers, if you think of the mutual fund industry, consumers have started to uh, respond to products based on ESG sustainability. Um, they're getting flows, and and so it's really the way. It's it's a it's nice to see that reaction, and and basically our industry likes to make products. Basically, so there has been a good development there. There's also another thing in the industry called. Um, Momentum, which is another word for following the flock, which is ba the basis. It's supposed to be a forecasting industry, but it's actually based on following um, everybody else, as you know. And um, but there is a momentum where you get people are investors are getting a little afraid that other investors are going into the, these kinds of industries or these kinds of companies, and they want to be on the on that train. But 50% of the assets in Europe are in ESG, and may, most of that means that they're having a dialogue. Now, I'm kind of a radical ESG person. I don't think dialogue with a coal company is worth your time. I don't think dialogue with any company that has racial or sexual harassment is worth your time. They can turn around, obviously, um, but that's that's not really ESG. Um, so. I, and I think we have a couple of clouds. One of them that is, to me, a mystery is if you listen, most of you are members of the, the Church of Climate, but, and if you listen to you on Rockstrom, you would expect to be reading every day in the newspaper forecasts of what's going to happen to interest rates, stock market prices, 
um, purchasing prices, raw materials due to climate. And that should be the foundation for any investor in deciding what's cheap and what's expensive. And I don't see that. There's a lot of talk about COVID. I think COVID is, is, is something that we will manage. It will have big impact. But it's nothing compared to the radical changes mm. the climate will bring. And you won't see that, I don't think, in any pension fund management today um, in their macroeconomic analysis. So just a couple of things. Uh, Five years ago, 67 of the 100 largest pension funds in the world said that climate had no relevance to their work and they'd never discussed it in their board. So that's probably changed, but that's a long way to go. Um, two years ago, I was at a conference with the corporate governance uh, leader for BlackRock, which has a big mouth. She then said that they couldn't uh, exclude any companies that misbehaved because of their what's called fiduciary duties, which is your responsibility to your investors. Now, obviously, Larry Fink has changed his mind, and that's wonderful, but that's still a very short transition. And finally, the other black cloud in my mind is the tech companies. We're not demanding enough. Uh, you say that the millennials won't work there, but apparently they will. Um, and the diversity is, is terrible. Uh, the way they treat their employees is terrible, and the privacy issues are terrible, and maybe some of them have climate issues. Um, so we really have a lot left to do, um, despite the very hopeful climate that we always have when we come to Norquan. Um, go over on the other side of the tracks, and, and then be, you'll feel the, <laughs> the beat again. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a Swedish word called lagom. I don't know if you should... Take it's it not or. too much and it's not too little. It's just perfect. Yeah. And when, thank you. And when we were writing the book, we were talking with a dear friend, Mark Boutros, who's a global strategist at Omnicon Group. And in the interview, he said to us when we were talking about how do we best portray this whole Swedish thing, and he said, well, you can't be logum in a Lady Gaga world. <laughs> so who better to explain what you meant by that than you, Mark? Well, I I mean, I think I've known both of you for my entire tenure here, or time in, in Sweden, and I came from the United States 10 years ago. And one of the things that I noticed right away when I first met you, both of you, um, was that, oh, we're trying, we're doing okay, you know, we can do better, you know, these are the things that we're working on. And everyone else around the world was like, we're the best and we're number one and we're, we're achieving this. And, and the Swedes were, you know, oh, we can do more and, you know, we're not too bad and we're on the other side of the wall and winter <laughs> is coming and we're trying, <laughs> all of these things. And I'd be like, yeah, but this is the best country in the world and how do you really embrace that? And I feel like when we need to think about when we think about sustainability, how do we inspire and how do we engage and how do we add so much um, energy to the conversation so that people want to choose SAS, for example, over one of the competitors that are less worthy of our time and of our money or, or drive a um, Scania truck or participate in, you know, um, uh, or use karma, or any of these things, and how do we embed enthusiasm mm. the way um, some of the non-Swedes would, or the Americans would, just to motivate and inspire people to really just remember there is a goal, um, and what maybe Larry or what BlackRock said five years ago is not the future, and how do we just really keep Going that. So I think in this world, maybe Lagom's not okay. Maybe we need to go and be Lady Gaga and say we need to make the world a better place. We need to inspire change. We need to do more, be more. That was that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> hey, Henrik, it's time to wrap. Yeah, so time to wrap up. So some uh, closing reflection then from, from our side. Um, there is no time to lose at all, and uh, the corporate world will and can make the big difference. Uh, companies can step up, and um, we truly believe that sustainability and profitability goes together, hand in hand, actually. And I think what you need to figure out, regardless of uh, what you are leading, yourself or a company or an organization, is that what sort of legacy do you want to leave behind? 
What do you want to sort of transfer to the next generation? And not only your own family then, but also the next generation of management or leaders in your company. And I am truly convinced that whatever industry or sector you're into, you will sooner or later hit the tipping point. A tipping point where it will no longer be possible to run a company that is not truly sustainable. Because no one will want to buy your products or services, or no one would like to invest in your company, and no one would like to work for you. So that's the concluding remark. The time to act is now. Time to take a stand, put a stake in the ground. It's time to be relevant. And we think with the book that if even, you know, the book is just meant to be inspiration. It's not really meant to be an academic guide. It's, it's more to take it, read it, use it, tweak it, make it yours, take parts of it, take all of it. We don't care, but we think if even one person or one business leader uses it, then it will have been worth it, right? Yeah, correct, it is. And with that, we would like to uh, thank everyone who contributed and helped us with this uh, project and the book. And there will be a list at the end of this event uh, that you will see all the, the great people that helped us uh, make this happen and, and, uh, and help us pay this forward. We would also like to say thank you to all the organizers of this event today. Thank you, Niklas and, and, and uh, Norshen here for, for a great sort of um, event organizing that for us. Uh, all the proceeds, by the way, will go to uh, to Norshen, uh, all the proceeds from the book uh, sales, uh, to spur, uh, hopefully, then uh, uh, the development of even more sustainable, purpose-driven superstar startups uh, in, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this house where we are standing today. And thank you, um, all of you watching, all of those thousands of people out there, all you change makers out there. Uh, now it's time to uh, get up, wake up, and, and start to act. Use your uh, voice, uh, your wallet, and your vote. And, and then we will make sure that this starts to move. Thanks for joining. Thank you.